most recently the Edinburgh Critical Edition of the Selected Writings of Andrew Lang. This evening his, um, his lecture is on the fairy tale collections of Andrew Lang and Joseph Jacobs and we welcome him to the university. Uh, thanks very much. It's, it's delightful to be here and thanks to the Sussex Centre for the invites and in particular to Bill Gray who commissioned this uh, uh, but sadly can't be here this evening. Um, and I particularly like the picture of me on the flyer because it was a photo from our uh, last graduation when we gave an honorary doctorate to Simon Callow. Uh, so just beside me is Simon Callow, who's usually the most interesting person in the photo. But in this instance, he's been chopped off, and I am the most important place. Um, so I'm going to talk about these two significant acts of 19th century fairy tale collection in Britain. Um, I'm also, I was also asked to briefly comment on uh, this beast, which took up two years of my life. Um, that's half the beast, it's in two volumes. Um, so I'll try and leave a little bit of time at the end just to say a few things about that. Um, but primarily we're talking about uh, Joseph Jacobs and Andrew Lang. Um, so Joseph Jacobs' English fairy tales uh, and the first of Andrew Lang's enormously popular coloured uh, fairy books, the Blue Fairy Book, were published within one year of each other. They are arguably uh, the two most influential and enduring contributions to the canon of fairy tale collection uh, to emerge in Britain in the 19th century. Uh, and yet, as collections of traditions, their objectives and assumptions couldn't be more different. One seeks to consolidate a collection of rather scattered narratives from England uh, known in Scotland, America and Australia, all under the unifying banner of Englishness and in so doing to try and forge that elusive grail and English fairy tale collection. Uh, the other seeks to showcase, showcase a wide cross-section of European and international narratives and thereby to bring domesticated versions of the narratives of the world to Britain. Uh, one has a nationalist orientation to the extent at least that it seeks to gather together the narratives of the nation. Uh, the other has transnational ambitions uh, and in its title it explicitly refuses the national gesture by naming the collection after a colour, uh, a location neutral designation, a designation that evokes multiplicity, the colours of the world, uh, and equally important for Lang and his publishers uh, a designation that could be almost endlessly repeated to great commercial advantage. Uh, when thinking about these two books and their proximity and time, uh, two questions occur. Why is it that these two major contributions to British fairy tale publication appear at this moment in history uh, and so close together? And why is it that two collections appearing so close in time should end up pursuing such different, even, we might say, contrary objectives. Um, one answer to this conundrum that I'd like to propose today is that both collections are divergent responses to the same set of cultural and political problems that become manifest in Britain towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, the problem of the increasing fragility of the British Empire uh, and of the simultaneous threat to Britain posed by Irish, <coughs> Scottish and Welsh separatist movements. Uh, but first let me say a little bit more about each of these collections and their authors. So there's pictures of Joseph Jacobs, there's far more pictures of Andrew Lang, much better pictures of Andrew Lang uh, because he was by far the more celebrated of the two. Uh, Jacobs, we tend to have these grainy uh, pictures uh, cut out of newspapers or book covers. Um, but here is uh, the one, uh, the best portrait of Jacobs, which is held by the National Portrait Gallery in London. Um, so Joseph Jacobs, born in Sydney, Australia in 1854. Uh, his father was a Londoner, John Jacobs, who travelled to New South Wales in 1837. Uh, and his mother, Sarah Myers. Uh, both were Jewish, and Joseph was a practising Jew throughout his life. Uh, he remained in Australia until he was 19, 
when he transferred from the University of Sydney to Cambridge University to study law. Uh, he intended to return to Australia on completion of his studies, uh, but following his graduation in 1876, he chose to remain in London and make a career as a writer. Uh, he worked as a ghostwriter on a book of dentistry, uh, and thereafter he involved himself increasingly in writing about Jewish history and culture, and simultaneously about folklore and tradition. Uh, notably, he wrote two prominent articles in the Times in 1882, condemning the persecution of the Jews in Russia, and he became a leading figure in the protest against Russian pogroms. Uh, his first book on folklore appeared in 1888, uh, a scholarly edition uh, titled The Earliest English Version of the Fables of Bidpai, uh, the Ancient Indian Collection of Animal Fables, now better known as the Panchatantra. Uh, describing the work, Jacobs observes as follows. I have to prepare myself for this quotation. I have edited Sir Thomas Norton's English version of an Italian adaptation of a Spanish translation of a Latin version of a Hebrew translation of an Arabic adaptation of the Pahlavi version of the Indian original. Um, so he already has a very healthy sense of the nature of transmission of texts and the extent to which tales can move between languages and traditions uh, and become transformed in the process. Uh, he then followed this with the collections that have made him a uh, household name and a Christmas perennial in England, uh, English fairy tales from 1890, Celtic fairy tales 1892, Indian fairy tales 1892, more English fairy tales 1894, uh, and more Celtic fairy tales 1894. Uh, and then right at the end of his life, the last year of his life, uh, after he'd moved to America, Europa's fairy book. Um, English fairy tales, as I've suggested, is not quite what its title might lead us to believe, a collection of English fairy tales. Uh, it is rather an act of will, uh, the act of will being to forge a collection of English tales out of sundry, and in many cases, non-English materials. The collection, we might say, is a kind of Frankenstein's monster, forged out of diverse body parts, unified by the fusive science of folklore. But like Frankenstein's monster, it's possible to see the stitches and the joins once one starts to probe closely. There are 43 tales in the collection. About 10 of them are fairy tales in the strict generic sense. Uh, and these include such important contributions to English tradition as Tom Tip Tot, The Rose Tree, Kappa Rushes, and Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, otherwise, the collection includes nursery tales, cautionary tales, ballads, condensed chapbooks, uh, tales of fairy abduction, cumulative narratives, and so on. Uh, they are, in other words, highly diverse in form and in genre. There are also fictions that derive from a wide range of regional and national sources. Uh, the first story in the collection, Tom Tip Tot, and the 11th <coughs> Cup of Rushes, derived from Suffolk. Uh, they were told to the minor Victorian poet, Anna Ward Thomas, by a family servant and written down by her for publication in the Ipswich Journal in 1877. Uh, we also have Jack and the Beanstalk and Henny Penny. According to Jacobs, these were told to him <coughs> by a nursemaid in Australia when he was a child. Uh, Nick's Not Nothing was collected by Andrew Lang from his great, great aunt in <coughs> Murrayshire and published by him, Lang, that is, for the first time in the St Andrews University magazine in 1863. Uh, Johnny Cake and How Jack Went to Seek His Fortune were both collected in America and published in the American Journal of Folklore. Jacobs has endeavoured to smooth over this diversity of material as much as possible. The act of placing the stories together in a collection, side by side, serves to give them the appearance of being a coherent group. Jacobs has also passed the wand of homogeneity over the collection through his editorial interventions in the stories. Uh, some of these are overt. The stories uh, Binori and Child Rowland are adaptations of ballads that Jacobs has, in his own words, prosed. Um, other interventions are more subtle. Lang's story, originally titled Nicked Nought Nothing, 
has been retitled Nix, Naught, Nothing, the more Anglo-American Nix, presumably being more comprehensible to an English readership than the Scottish Nicked. Uh, and this provides a pattern of alterations throughout the story in which the Scotch dialect of Lang's original becomes a more standard English. Ben, for instance, becomes child. Uh, likewise, in Anna, Anna Walter Thomas's Suffolk dialect tales, the English has been standardised by Jacobs. Uh, Tom Tit Tot, uh, for instance, is the start of the story. Tom Tit Tot, um, uh, Suffolk Rumpelstiltskin story. Uh, at the beginning of the story, a young girl uh, reveals her stupidity, her slovenliness, her greed by eating five pies that her mother has just baked. Um, Jacob's source tale, uh, which was written down by Anna Walter Thomas but then appropriated by, uh, by Claude, uh, is on the left hand side, uh, the red and well, the black isn't too glaring in contrast. Um, well, once upon a time there were a woman and she baked five pies. And when they come out of the oven, they was that overbaked, the crust were too hard to eat. So she says to her daughter, Mara, says she, put you down their pies on the shelf and leave them there a little, and they'll come again. She meant, you know, the crust did get soft. But the gal, she says to herself, well, if they'll come again, I'll eat them now. And she set to work and ate them all, first and last. Um, so a good comic beginning to the story. Um, as you'll see from the words marked in red, uh, when this appears in Jacob's text, um, there have been subtle, but nonetheless plentiful and significant transformations in the text. Um, principal amongst them, the Suffolk, Suffolk dialect word meaning daughter, Mara, uh, put in the voice of the mother, is disposed of and is replaced with the phonetically modified, but nonetheless more comprehensible word, data, which has been taken from the uh, objective narration uh, provided by Anna Walter Thomas. Uh, the transpositions reveal it. Um, the objective narrative becomes fully standardised in its English, or more standardised, uh, becomes daughter, whilst the element of dialect formerly in the objective narration, data, is uh, relegated into direct speech. Arguably, <coughs> the divisions here are being hardened that distinguish the authorised English of the narration, of the objective narration, from the subjective speech of the protagonists. Sorry. It's okay. This practice of interfering with the textual integrity of the source narratives <coughs> caused some consternation amongst Jacob's contemporaries in the folklore society. Uh, Lawrence Gong encapsulates uh, these objections in a bad-tempered comment uh, made in his presidential address to the Folklore Society in 1891. Uh, my friends, my, sorry, my friend Mr. Jacobs, he says, wishes to put into the hands of reading English children a collection of traditional English tales. He finds them too incomplete or rude in their traditional form, so he eliminates a malodorous and un-English skunk from one tale, reduces the dialect of such a tale as Tom Tip Tot, and tells us of all these gay doings in his notes. I'm sure my friend Mr. Jacobs will forgive me for using his production as a literary artist to push home my argument as a folklorist. Uh, these tales will be read, not told. Read by the children who are brought up on bright and well-pictured books, not by the peasant children from whom the tales are originally taken. And the appeal of those who use them will always be from book to book, not from tradition to tradition. Literature such as this may and does kill tradition, but it does not create it. Uh, Jacobs, and he also comments on Lang's connection in the same, uh, in the same speech, and Lang also was quite stunned by this because he comments on it in one of his introductions to the Coloured Berry books. Um, but Jacobs too was stung into making a response to these objections in his preface to more English fairy tales published four years after uh, the first volume. My folklore friends look on with sadness, he writes, while they view me laying profane hands on the sacred text of my originals 
This is rank sacrilege in the eyes of the rigid orthodox in matters folklorical. My defence might be that I had, the cause, I had a cause at heart as sacred as our science of folklore, the filling of our children's imaginations with bright trends and images. But even on the lofty heights of folklore science, I'm not entirely defenceless. Do my friendly critics believe that even Campbell's materials had not been modified by the various narrators before they reached the great JF? Why may not I have the same privilege as any other storyteller, especially when I know the ways of storytelling as she's told in English, at least as well as a Devonshire or Lancashire peasant? Uh, so Jacob suggests, the collection is not intended as a work of folklore science, it's designed to entertain children, and anyway, he's only doing what all other storytellers and collectors do uh, themselves. Uh, Jacobs also defends his use of fictions taken from outside England, anticipating these objections in his preface to English fairy tales. Um, he writes, uh, this is Jacobs in the top left corner, he writes, I have acted on Moliere's principle and have taken what was good wherever I could find it. Thus, a couple of these stories have been found among descendants of English Im immigrants in America. A couple of others I tell as I heard them myself in my youth in Australia. I've also included some stories that have only been found in Lowland Scotch. Uh, I have felt justified in doing this, as of the 21 folktales contained in Chambers' Popular Rhymes of Scotland, no less than 16 are also found in an English form. With the folktale, as with the ballad, Lowland Scotch may be regarded as simply a dialect of English, and it is a mere chance whether a tale is extant in one or other or both. Uh, this acknowledgement is strained and partial, I suggest. It's by no means clear that Lowland Scots would agree that theirs is simply a dialect of English, and indeed many objected to this forced assimilation of Scottish traditions into an English collection. In the pages of the Saturday Review on November the 8th, 1890, a self-identified infuriated Caledonian wrote uh, as follows. This is on the other side of the overhead. Um, this would sound better in a Scottish accent, but not in mine, so I'm just going to deliver it in standard English. Um, pock pudding here is a derogatory <coughs> Scottish term for an Englishman. Mr. Jacobs has no business to do the Scotch tales into English. It is the Scot, and not the pock pudding, who has preserved the best stories. Mr. Jacobs is enough to make one a Scotch home ruler. Um, but this reviewer reserves his fury especially for a bannock. Uh, it is fairly calm conduct in Mr. Jacobs to bring in a substance called a Johnny Cake, which may be American for a bannock. Uh, a Johnny Cake, in a legend like this, is simply an outrage. Um, a bit unfair on Jacobs, that one, because Jacobs actually takes this from an American story and the transformation's already been made, but we take the general point. Um, the argument that stories, that made by Jacobs, that stories can be included in an English collection <coughs> simply because variants of those stories uh, can also be found in England is, is rather unconvincing. Um, if that's the case, why not just use the English words instead of the Scottish ones? One wonders. Um, but the fact is, what Jacobs is doing has very little to do with the accurate representation of storytelling traditions and everything to do with his cultural project. Uh, and that is to bend the materials he has at hand to this purpose of forging a national collection, to create the impression that all the tales in the collection come from the same place, that were spoken in the same voice, uh, the voice of England telling stories as one. Uh, in doing this, Jacobs is uh, fulfilling a project that many other folklorists and collectors have been pursuing around Europe, and indeed throughout the world for the previous 80 years or so. Uh, this project, as is well known, had been initiated by the Brothers Grimm, who between 1812 and 1815 had assembled the first volume of their tales. Uh, in so doing, they provided a scholarly model for the collation of diverse materials into a coherent <coughs> national collection. Uh, following the lead of the Grimm's, a host of comparable collections appeared, including Thomas Crofton Croker's 
uh, fairy legends and traditions of the south of Ireland, uh, Elias Lonro's epic assemblage of Finnish songs, the Kalevala, Nogenmoen, Peter Asjonsson's Norwegian folk tales, and Rick Stefanovic Karadic's uh, Serbian folk tales, and Afanasov's uh, Russian folk tales, all within a relatively limited period of time. And the principal objective of these collections is to preserve as much as possible the narrative traditions of a defined set of people at a time when those traditions were felt to be uh, under pressure, disappearing because of urbanisation, industrialisation, and so on. Jacobs arrives rather late at this party um, with his English fairy tales, but nonetheless he regards his project as being directly in line with that of the Graves. In his preface to more English fairy tales, he notes with pride that the first volume had, in four short years, established itself as a kind of English grim. Uh, an obvious question to pose at this point is why it took the English so long to follow suit uh, and to attempt the creation of an English grim. The English folklorist W.J. Toms, uh, inventor of the term, or in the English term folklore, in his preface to the Lays and Legends of Germany in 1834, had lamented that no collectors of legendary lore had yet dedicated themselves to the collection of English traditions. Uh, he writes, we must close our list of works on the subject of legendary law. Not one of them, alas, dedicated to the preservation of the legends of our fatherland. To rescue these scattered relics from the hand of time is one of the principal objects of our little work, and one in which we most earnestly implore <coughs> the assistance of our readers. But no such volume appeared uh, in the early or middle part of the 19th century. Collections of local legends appear, uh, some anthologies of English fairy lore and literature, but it wasn't until the 1890s that a serious endeavour was made to assemble a pan-English collection. But then suddenly, in the 1890s, uh, it all comes in a rush. Hartland's English folk and fairy tales in 1890, Jacob's English fairy tales, also 1890. 1892, Hazlitt's Tales and Legends of National Origin, or widely current in England from early times. Sabine Baring Gould's Old English Fairy Tales, 1895, and so on. A sudden, large scale, comprehensive endeavor to invent a tradition. Uh, why? Why had it taken 78 years for the publication of the first volume of Grimm for a pan English collection to appear? And why, when it did happen, was it suddenly so emphatic and extensive? A common answer to this is that the English had a harder task uh, than other national collectors because they no longer had a store of traditional tales to preserve in the way that the Germans or the Finns or the Celts had. Uh, our Saturday reviewer claims that the reason Jacobs is forced to steal Scottish fairy tales is that the English have been careless and lost their own. Uh, but we can be suspicious of this argument. Um, the history of folk narrative collection suggests that if the need is there, uh, it's always possible to find or to fabricate a collection of traditions. Uh, so my view is rather that what was missing beforehand were not the traditions, but the motivation, the political and social circumstances were not there to make the collection of English law meaningful. Indeed, we might even argue that the collection of English traditions in the early 19th century would have actively disadvantaged the English in their broader global ambitions. What's, what's notable about many of the national uh, contexts in which the collections of traditions were made at the start of the 19th century is that they almost invariably involve situations of struggle. When the Grimms began collecting, Napoleonic troops had overrun large tracts of German territory and Napoleon had established the vassal kingdom of Westphalia under the rule of his brother, Jerome Bonaparte, which incorporated the Grimm's hometown of Cassel. Uh, in Serbia, Karadzic began publishing his collection of Serbian national songs in 1814, recognising in these traditions a record of the Serbian people's opposition to the Turks during four centuries of Turkish oppression. And in Finland, the collection of Finnish 
traditions and the assemblage, assemblage of the Kalevala takes place in the context of Russian political and cultural domination. These collections arose, in other words, as part of a cultural revival, which was formulated in response to a set of pressing threats to the culture in question. In England, at the same time, by contrast, the problem of national identity is quite different. Uh, in the first place, Englishness in the late 18th and early 19th century is not embattled, it is in the ascendant. The English were the wealthiest, uh, most influential nation in the Union of Great Britain, and they'd become, within Britain, part of a major imperial power. They had far less need to create national collections of traditions to give themselves cultural rooting. Uh, as the historian Christian Kumar and Linda Coll uh, historians as Christian Kumar and Linda Colley have argued, the English, for most of their history, uh, saw themselves uh, as in the mirror of the larger enterprises in which they were engaged. They found their identity as constructors of Great Britain, creators of the British Empire, pioneers of the world's first industrial civilization. More than this, it was in many ways actively disadvantageous to English identity to encourage acts of national differentiation. England was powerful because it was part of Britain, and Britain was the engine of empire. Uh, in this context, England's elites didn't want or need a separate identity from Britain. More importantly, Britain didn't want the nations over which it exercised imperial rule in India, Africa, Australia, the Caribbean, to have nationalist ambitions. Separatist nationalism was a danger to English power in the world. Uh, as Christian Kumar observes, nationalism of one sort or another has been the main solvent of modern empires. So the nationalist motivations that gave rise to collections such as the Grimm's or Longrose in the early 19th century didn't find any traction in England. So thus, in Kumar's words, there is no equivalent in England to the nationalist theory of a herder or a fict, no English Grimm or Savigny, no searching of the national soul as is to be found in 19th century Russian literature, no nationalist movements of the kind found <coughs> throughout continental Europe in the 19th century. The question then arises as to what changes between the early 19th century and the later 19th century to create conditions more favourable to the collection of English national traditions. Uh, the answer lies in part in the fact that towards the end of the 19th century, the global pol political situation had begun to shift. The empire had faced some serious challenges. Britain's rivals, France, Germany, Russia, the United States, Japan, were growing more powerful. Britain's economic advantages diminished. Its naval supremacy was challenged. There had been disastrous and disillusioning campaigns in Afghanistan and in the struggle against the Boers in South Africa. The Indian National Congress had been formed in 1885 with the express aim of securing a greater role in government for Indians. The empire suddenly seemed vulnerable. Uh, the Union of Britain, moreover, had become strained as a result of strong expressions of ethnic and cultural nationalism in the various parts of the British Isles. Uh, notably, through the Gaelic revival in Ireland and the rediscovery and reinvention of Celtic culture and history in Wales and Scotland. In 1885, Scottish administrative devolution began with the creation of a Scottish office and a secretary for Scotland. In the same year, Charles Stuart Parnell's Irish Parliamentary Party secured a significant majority of Irish seats in the general election. And a year later, in 1886, Cymru Fid, Young Wales, was established to agitate for Welsh home rule. Uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, Cumar <coughs> argues, the English began to face the prospect of the diminishment, possibly the end, of Britain's imperial mission. And simultaneously, they began to face the prospect of a breakup of Britain. At this point, they began to ask themselves a powerful question. Who would we be without Britain and the empire? Who exactly are the English? We've invested our identity for so long in these supranational agglomerations, Britain, empire, global mission. 
Uh, what is left to us alone uh, when, if these things go? Uh, this question, Kumar argues, generated a large swathe of cultural output that characterizes English art and letters at the, in the fin de siècle. In this moment of cultural revival, we might include uh, the music of Vaughan Williams, of its stirring English pastoral nostalgia, the art of the pre-Raphaelites um, with its appetite uh, for images of uh, English medievalism uh, and its appetite simultaneously for English legendary traditions. Cecil Sharp's collection of English folk songs from 1903 uh, but also not mentioned by Kumar uh, and rarely ever mentioned in this context. In fact, Joseph Jacob's two bold endeavours to finally identify a distinctive English contribution to tradition, English fairy tales, and more English fairy tales. This isn't to suggest that Jacob's collection is an act of blunt jingoism. Uh, Jacob's biography suggests a more complicated relationship to national identity, uh, the power of a nation. In particular, Jacob's, as a Jew, would have been suspicious of the model of national identity that depends upon the assertion of homogenous ethnic majorities and the marginalisation or exclusion of minority groups. In fact, what Jacob's implicitly seeks through his collection is an image of stability. Uh, he's looking for a way to ensure the coherence and the continuity. Uh, he believes that we are, to use a current slogan, better together. Uh, and in the 1890s, Jacob saw that unifying, that unifying capacity as being centred on England. So he silently aligns the other members of Britain and the wider members of the later Commonwealth behind England as a ballast uh, against the alarming disruption and change that might ensue in the loosening of empire and a loss of coherence in the British Isles. Uh, he also draws together the regions of Britain, minimising their differences, creating a common language, <coughs> arguing for a unity of purpose. Uh, what Jacobs creates, in other words, is a kind of working model for the Union, a host of different tales taken from different sources, regional and national, cohabit peacefully in one volume. Uh, it's named after England, but England is more a guarantor of stable governance, cohesive statecraft, than, a, than an assertion of ethnic particularity. In an indirect way, Jacobs is in fact reasserting the idea of Britain in English fairy tales. Uh, what English means here is the British Isles, united under the leadership of England, and this is the status quo that Jacobs endeavours to defend. Uh, if we turn now to consider the collections of Andrew Lang, we find, as I suggested at the beginning, a very different approach to cultural developments in Britain at the fin de siècle. Lang knew Jacobs well. They met frequently as fellow members of the Folklore Society, but in many respects they disagreed on scholarly matters. Uh, Lang was born in Selkirk, was one of the principal Scottish writers of his day, was one of those who'd objected vociferously to Jacob's practice of regarding lowland Scotch tales as English traditions. Uh, the most fundamental scholarly disagreement between the pair, however, arose from their advocacy of what were at times the dominant, what were at the time, sorry, the dominant opposing arguments about the origin and spread of traditional tales. Jacob's was a diffusionist who believed that stories originated in a single place and were then spread and transformed by huge human agents over time. Lang, by contrast, whilst he regarded diffusion as playing a <coughs> crucial role in the dissemination of tale types, maintained that some of the similarities in narrative elements in folk narrative traditions from diverse peoples across the globe were a product of independent invention. Um, in particular, he argued, along with other proponents of what became known as the Anthropological School of Folklore Studies, that the folklores of diverse people contain similar elements because folktales originate when society is at its savage stage. 
since we've all passed through a savage stage, according to Lang's progressive perception of civilizational development, we all therefore have a survival uh, in our folk tales from this, this moment of savagery. Uh, in these explorations of the folklore method, lie the seeds of Lang's practice as an anthologist of fairy tales. Uh, as a scholar, Lang's interest, Lang's interest is primarily in what makes the traditions of diverse people similar. His primary concern is to show what we share with one another and to trace these elements, shared elements back to our common passage through savagery. And one of the most, most effective ways to demonstrate this, Lang argues, is to place the tales of diverse people side by side in order that they can be compared and their fundamental affinities noted. It's precisely this comparative method that's then applied in his later fairy tale anthologies, which are eclectic in character, but comparativist in spirit. They show how varied the world's tales are, but with the intention of demonstrating uh, fundamental similarities between peoples across the globe. Um, thus, the Blue Fairy Book, though it's made up predominantly of European traditions, from Perrault, Grimm, Thornoir, and others, uh, also presents a tale from the Levant, and three stories from the Arabian Nights, and later collections include, alongside the tales of Europe, stories from China, India, the Middle East, Africa, and so on. Lang's prefaces to foreground for a mass audience his scholarly mission uh, to discover comparisons. This, for instance, is from his introduction to the Blue Fairy Book. Even a child must recognise, as he turns the pages of the Blue Fairy Book, that the same adventures and something like the same plots meet him in stories translated from different languages. The Scotch Black Bull of Norway, for example, must remind the very youngest reader of East of the Sun, the West of the Moon, a tale from the Norse. Both, again, have manifest resemblances to Beauty and the Beast, and every classical student has the fable of Eros and Psyche brought back to his memory, while every anthropologist recalls a similar Mark Merkin amongst Kafirs and Basutos. These resemblances and analogies recur on every page. As passages like this demonstrate, Lang resists the national impulse that characterises so much uh, fairy tale collection in the 19th century. Tales should be collected not to demonstrate cultural particularity, racial distinctiveness, but to undermine it, according to Lang. In his critical writing in Journalism 2, uh, he explicitly resists the nationalist approach to literature. In his essay on the Celtic Renaissance, for Blackwood's magazine in 1897, for instance, he rejects the claim made by some of the neo-Celts that the best things in English literature derive from Celtic influences uh, on the grounds that the relations of race to poetic and other mental qualities is a mystery. He writes, when we bring race into literary criticism, we dally with that unlovely, fluent, enchantress popular science. So Lang's sympathies in these regards and with the older model of cultural affiliation prior to what Kumar calls the moment of Englishness. As a Scot, he would have been excluded by any assertion of English particularism, but he also rejected Celtic separatism. Uh, it's safe to assume that Lang wouldn't have been a devolutionist. Uh, the trans-border social and political allegiances of Britain provided his natural <coughs> cultural, intellectual and political grounding. They also form the imaginative setting of some of his most effective fictions. The, the novella The Golden Fairly, for instance, uh, is one of his most compelling works, uh, and that conflates the borderlands of England and Scotland with the borderlands dividing the realms of fairy, the fairy world and the human world. And these resistances to nativism in Lang, in one respect, mark a distinction between his books and Jacob's, uh, which, as we've suggested, has the nativist ambition to define an English narrative. <coughs> uh, and yet, both these collectors are responding to the same historical situation. Lang also felt 
the anxiety attendant upon the fractures in empire. Uh, he sensed the old world trembling, and he understood, like many of his contemporaries, that the power of Britain, the security of Britain, would be challenged by this realignment. Uh, he too resorted to the materials of folklore to stage a kind of symbolic expression of togetherness under one banner in order to ward off the disruption and disorder that would ensue from a crumbling of the imperial mandate. Uh, Lang's activities take place on a much bigger canvas than Jacob's. He endeavours to draw into his collection the narratives of the world, unite them under the rainbow colours of the fairy book. But in many respects, Lang enacts the same gesture as Jacob's. He seeks to homogenise, to draw together, to shore up. Uh, he creates a symbolic commonwealth of nations as a spell against the disintegra disintegratory pressures of an empire in decline. Uh, importantly, too, it's the idea of Britain as a union, as the centre of empire, that for Lang, as for Jacobs, offers the best guarantee of the stability of this commonwealth. Um, this is reflected in Lang's tale collections. They're international, as we've seen, but they don't dissolve civilizational hierarchies. Europe remains the symbolic centre, the model of civilizational advancement, whilst the tales incorporated into later collections for the remoter reaches of empire are drawn from the margins and illustrate uh, the cultures of societies at more primitive stages of development in Lang's terminology. Britain is the motive authority that made it possible for these stories from multiple lands to be drawn together, uh, and the stories are being anthologised and their compatibility ensured, ensured from Britain uh, as a centre. Uh, in these respects, the collection of Jacobs and Lang are more sympathetic than not. Jacobs draws together the idea of England, Lang draws together the narratives of the world. But both acts of unification are enacted in the interests of Britain, of the British Union and the political arrangements that Britain historically represents today. Um, let me note, finally, since this is both the centenary of Joseph Jacob's death uh, and the centenary of the Battle of the Somme, that both Jacob's and Lang's anxieties about the impact of a crumbling empire were born out. Uh, their desire to reassert stability through their unifying gestures retrospectively can be seen as thoroughly rational and reasonable. Many of the first readers of these fairy books, uh, who would have been children in the 1890s, died in the trenches of France in a war that was in part the outcome of the weakening of empire. Uh, these young men, young men went to war perhaps thinking of Jack going to do battle against the giants, and in their deaths, the childhood hopes fostered by the stories of Jacobs and Lang died too. Uh, in light of this, it becomes clearer what writers such as Jacobs and Lang were endeavouring to staunch. They perceived dimly the calamities that the weakening of the old world order would bring, and in their small way, they endeavoured to write against it, to draw together, to impose unity, to impose consensus. Uh, that consensus for them was Britain and empire. And in this respect, at least, their collections may be seen as an endorsement of imperial ambitions. But importantly, it wasn't an endorsement that necessarily proclaimed the rightness of empire. Uh, Jacob's English tales, in some respects, may be seen as posing a question to empire. Have we overextended? Have we threatened the coherence of Englishness by investing so heavily in the rest of the world? Are we losing ourselves? Uh, in fact, both Jacobs and Lang were involved in an endorsement of the idea of Britain and the empire that was motivated by fear of the alternative. What would happen, these collections ask, if Britain and the empire should fail? Um, and that's the conclusion. My, um, I did promise I'd say a few things about, about this. Um, this is half of it. There's another two-volume work. It's the 
selected uh, writings of, I can't even remember the title myself, the Edinburgh Critical Edition of the Selected Writings of Andrew Lang, and it's in two volumes, the first volume probably most, of most interest to fairy tale scholars, because uh, the second one is more about his journalism and his writing on Scotland. Um, it was two years of intensive work, um, and I completely underestimated the amount of work it would take when I began it. Um, whole evenings were sometimes spent on a single footnote. Um, me and my two other contributors. Um, the difficulty was intensified by Lang's idiosyncrasies. Um, there are three things in particular that are intensely annoying about Lang. First of all, this is appalling handwriting. Uh, so when you're dealing with the letters, uh, you have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out these hieroglyphic scribbles. Um, secondly, is the huge volume of his output. Lang produced a terrific amount of work, and trying to get a to even two volumes of selected work out of that was a great challenge. Um, the third irritating thing is his prodigious and willful inaccuracies. Um, on almost every page of his work, there are wrong page numbers and volumes, um, wrong titles, misquotations, misattributions. Uh, he liked to say that he wrote the path and at high speed, uh, and you can tell uh, he never checks any of his quotations, and they are very often uh, wrongly memorized. So a great deal of time was spent hunting through obscure volumes of 19th century folklore for the correct page of a quotation which Lang had, had mis, uh, misidentified. Um, so I became enormously irritated and hostile towards Lang in the process, um, but at the same time I began to appreciate uh, that Lang at his best is also an extremely dynamic and agile and eloquent writer, um, immensely learned, well-read, eclectic, eclectic uh, in his ambitions, and though he'd probably fail a PhD upgrade viva because of the quality of his referencing, um, the, the work itself more than compensates um, for those scholarly uh, challenges. Um, I just wanted to read what is one of my favourite passages from Lang's writing. Um, and this appears in the introduction to the Red Fairy Book. Uh, and I've chosen it in part two because it is one of the most moving and poignant uh, celebrations of the fairy tale as a narrative form. Um, Lang is writing about the fairy tale as a form of narrative which will endure beyond anything. So he's writing about its, its durability. Uh, and this is on page 156 of my volume. Stories like these will live or will revive when, in the changes of human fortunes, science has been lost, when electricity and steam and chemistry are buried with their engines and their crucibles beneath the ruins of a world and under the accumulations of innumerable earthworms. Faiths and empires and philosophies have crumbled and faded and left the fairy folk happy still in their kingdom beyond the river which runs knee-deep with blood. In all generations, the fairy queen will have her lovers and will carry them off like true Thomas to her twilight realm, whence they will issue again with those legends of her domain. These will be heard when the steam whistle is silent and when the crack of the rifle, the roar of the cannon, are sounds forgotten and unknown. Again, they will inspire poetry, again be the warp and woof of romance, immortal while man lives, and only to be forgotten when the chill ball of earth rolls round a frozen sun. They are our oldest legacy. They will be our last bequest, flitting from mouth to mouth when the printing press is in ruins and the alphabet has to be reinvented. Uh, and that's Andrew Lang. Thank you very much. Yeah, completely. Huge, huge literary investment and interest in fairy tales, but often not exclusively English. It was the idea of a, a specifically English collection that, that yeah, was elusive. No, but um, what I meant was, um, you know, the, there wasn't a 
was a literary tradition that wasn't really fairy tales, you know. Yeah. Yeah, completely. And Dickens and, and company, yeah. they're all very interested in popular narrative tradition. Writers were always interested in popular narrative traditions and draw on their own um, their own cultural traditions in a very fluid and free way. Um, I absolutely agree. Um, what is distinctive about what Jacobs does, however, and his contemporaries do, uh, is to try and identify something that's specifically English um, rather than, than cross-cultural. And to to celebrate it for its, for its Englishness. So this is the first time there's really something that looks like an ethnic emphasis on, on the idea of an English narrative tradition. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, uh, okay. I guess to a certain extent, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course all these stories ex ex exist and they, they crop up throughout the 19th century. What Jacobs does is plunder the 19th century writing for these stories. Um, so I'm not saying they're not there or they're not being told and they're not being written. But what is significant is the act of pulling them all together, uh, creating a collection which is defined by its attempt to assemble these stories. Uh, and that's what I'm suggesting hasn't been done in, with the same intensity beforehand. I read this to a friend last night and she said, well, congratulations, you've just de delivered a lecture on fairy tales in which you haven't discussed a single fairy tale. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was about the, the process of collection and the politics of collection rather than the stories, but I'm happy to take questions on the stories too. On, on the process of collection, when you said one of them was published in the Ipswich Journal, yeah. I kind of thought, how did Joseph Jacobs then find it? He wasn't drawn through archives. Yeah. Jacobs didn't find it, uh, Edward Codd found it. Okay. Um, so um, the, the story has a, it's quite an interesting tra trajectory actually. So. Um, Anna Walter Thomas claimed she was told it by a, by a servant and then wrote it down. She claims that it's the kind of the authentic voice of this servant, although clearly she's imposing her literary skills upon it. Um, she was asked for a collection of traditions by the, the folklorist Francis Hines Groom um, for the Ipswich Journal, because he wanted to devote an issue, an issue of the Ipswich Journal to it. So she gave him that, he published it in the Ipswich Journal, Edward Clodd, the Folklore Society member, was then leafing through old copies uh, in the late 1880s and came across this story. And he thought it was a terrific example of English law. So he published it in a book about Tom Tip Top, didn't attribute it to Hannah Walter Thomas, um, and effectively presented it as if it was a story that he'd, um, he'd found himself. Um, and then Joseph Jacobs saw it in, uh, he also published it in the Folklore Journal, Joseph Jacobs saw it in the Folklore Journal in 1890 and published it himself in his book. And then Anna Walter Thomas came across a copy of this book and saw what was more or less her tale appearing in the first, in the first few pages. And she wrote a furious letter to the Times um, sort of complaining about this. And Joseph Jacobs was very apologetic and sent her a little note. And in later editions of uh, English fairy tales, he attributes, attributes it to her. Um, but it's one of those interesting stories about these stories, um, which makes the research into the transmission and collection of, of fairy tales so interesting. Hi. Um, mine was Scottish, yeah. and Jacob's was Australian. Yeah. Do you think there's anything interesting or relevant that they are the two people that to, to first do a collection of English fairy tales? Yeah, yeah. well, well um, Lang's wasn't English, it was international, um, and that is, I think that's probably partly why Lang does an international fairy tale collection because he doesn't have that identification of Englishness. Um, yes, Jacobs uh, was born in Australia, spent the first 19 years of his life in Australia, and I think that's partly why he has a perception on Englishness. Um, I think at that stage he probably would have um, identified himself as an English white settler in, in Australia, so there would have been still a strong sense that his connection with England, he wouldn't have felt himself to be Australian necessarily. But there, you're right, there is that disjunction from Englishness, which perhaps influences him to, to think about English identity, which results in the creation of the, the fairy tale collection. Um, but pre precisely because of his, out, the fact that he's outside Englishness, because of his Australian roots, but also because of his Jewishness, um, I think is what prevents him creating anything like an eth ethnic. Uh, collection. In fact, the, the collection is 
is quite critical of ethnic particularity. It's quite diverse. Um, there are stories in it which are quite jingoistic because they're taken from the chapbook tradition, which includes jingoistic fairy tales like Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, you can be read as a kind of a parable of English imperial conquest. The young, plucky young peasant goes to far off lands, steals their resources, kills the natives, returns to the mother country with his newfound wealth. You can imagine this as a chapbook being read by um, young men and women who are going out to the imperial administrators being inspired by this. Um, so there are quite jingoistic stories in the collection, but because they're taken from all over the place, there are other stories which are, which are more critical of, of the kinds of imperial ambitions <coughs> that you see in that story. Uh, the, there's a version of The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Do you remember what it's called? It's the third or fourth story in the collection. Um, something to do with the master. Um, which is about the desire for power and the hunger for knowledge, but it's also about the, the dangers of that. And you could almost read that as an allegory for um, the, the dangers of imperial overreaching, which is also what, what I think Jacob's collection is, is in part about. Stories are continuously being changed and transformed, and yes, you're right, once they enter writing, they gain a certain permanence, a, a kind of officialdom that they don't necessarily have in, in oral, uh, when, when they're being narrated orally. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that folklore always does start with oral traditions and then become written. Uh, I think often uh, pieces of writing, uh, often these traditions can begin with writing and then enter oral tradition. Um, Marina Warner, who was here a few weeks ago, I think, um, describes folklore as a kind of a bridge uh, between the oral and, uh, and the literary, in which people are continuously passing across it in both ways. Um, so it's about, folklore comes as a result of a transaction between all kinds of media, oral, literary, visual. Um, so it doesn't really have that kind of stable, the conventional idea of stable progress from oral to, to written. Um, but you're right, there is, a, there is a significant difference between an oral product and a literary product in terms of its, uh, its authority. But those authorities, even when they're written into literature or made into films, are continuously being challenged too. So it, it remains mobile even in those, uh, even in those formats. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.